Morning, church. Ready for this? You have no idea if you're ready for it or not. We're, uh, we're in this series called Here I Stand, and I, I want to start with this picture. Um, let's start with this here, and I'm sorry if you're hungry right now. Right? The smorgasbord. Might be the most awesome thing on the planet, right? The, this long buffet of food you can just go through. You don't have to take anything you don't like. You just take the things you do like and pile it up as high as you want and enjoy all this sumptuous food. Now, when it comes to food, the smorgasbord is unparalleled. It's probably the best thing ever. But when it comes to our faith and matters of religion and God, we can't treat these things like a smorgasbord. We can't have this vast serving station of religious faith options and then walk through it and choose what we want to believe, what we want to pick that we think is going to satisfy these longings that are in our hearts. The smorgasbord is a pretty poor way to treat faith, to treat our relationship with God. And I simply want to ask you this question. If there is indeed a God whose intention it is to reveal himself to us, do we really think that the way that he would do this would just having us, would have us pick and choose through whatever we want? In fact, there is a God who has revealed himself and who has told us some very specific things about himself in the revealed word of God, things that are must-believes for every Christian, things we must embrace, things we don't get to pick and choose our way through. Well, as we heard in the first message in this series, if you were uh, here last week and as we launched this 500 years ago, a man by the name of Martin Luther, a monk, a Catholic monk, began to sift through the Word of God and study it and read it, and he saw some things that were out of line with the church that he was a part of. He developed, in fact, 95 discussion points that he wanted to go through, and he took those 95 theses, and he nailed it to the door of the church, the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he launched the Protestant Reformation. Because he saw just how far the established church had drifted away from the very things that God had revealed about himself. And from history, we should take the lesson on ourselves and heed the warning. We're taking these weeks, in fact, to re-examine the essential core doctrines of our faith and to make the declaration that Martin Luther made. Here I stand on these important doctrines, lest we too drift away. And we're doing this, we're doing this to ensure that we don't fall into wrong belief, which always, always, always leads to wrong practice. So having laid that foundation with what we believe about the Bible last week, we now turn to theology, what's called theology proper, or the study of God. And specifically today, we're going to look at this. God the Father, the very first person of the Trinity. Over the next two weekends, you might guess them, we're also going to look at Uh, The doctrine of pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and the doctrine of Christology, the doctrine of Christ uh, in the coming weeks. And so we'll round out our study of the Trinity. And so uh, with that uh, kind of a setup, how would you you feel about praying before we get into God's Word? Sound good? All right, let's bow our heads and uh, seek the Father. Uh, God, as we come to you now, I I would uh, suppose that we're not even fully aware of all the ways that that lies are being told to us and we're being tempted to drift away from what your word says and how we can fall into believing all these things that we're told. Father, we know that this world, our own flesh, and the evil one himself are all waging war against us. And this is a not a warfare against flesh and blood the way we would normally see it. It's not even something we can see with our eyes. But Father, as your word says, this is a warfare with the cosmic powers of this present darkness. 
against spiritual forces of evil. And so, God, what we need more than anything else right now is your Holy Spirit to help us discern and decide for truth and for light. So we have your word open in front of us right now, and we would plead with you. Please, Father, teach us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You agree with that prayer? All right, let's get into this right now. All of these messages are set up the same way. We're going to start with this. Uh, What I believe, here's the uh, quick statement, God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. Now, let's define that word Trinity as best we can, understanding that every possible description, definition, illustration of the Trinity is going to fall short of all of the illustrations of the Trinity that we have All of them are bad ones, okay? There's nothing that's actually going to get us to the place where we could fully understand this. But let's take a shot at it. Sound good? We'll just take a shot, okay? So let's start with this. God exists. Here's a good little definition. Nothing new here. God exists as one God, yet there are three persons within the Godhead. Now, because each is fully God and there is only one God, all attributes of God apply to all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, okay, having said that every illustration of the Trinity is, Trinity is bad and inadequate, let me show you one. All right, so here's one here, and this helps us to understand the interrelationship, the equality, and the oneness of God, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is God, but is not the Son and is not the Spirit. The Son is God, but is not the Father, nor the Spirit. And the Spirit is God, but is not the Father, nor the Son. Does that clear everything up? I feel like you got it now. It's great. I totally understand the Trinity at this point. Um, Martin Luther said it this way. Although there are three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, yet the being is not divided or distinguished. Since there is but one God in one single, undivided, divine substance. Again, there's so much we could say about this. And at the end of the day, what we have to do is read the scriptures and understand them and say that we believe this, even though it might be beyond our grasp to fully understand it. We've done this illustration before, and I want you just to take a grip on your own skull for a second. Just get a grip on your skull. Please do this. Please do this. Okay, you got a grip on your skull. Now take that down and take a look at the size of that. Okay, that's the size of your brain. Okay, God is infinite. How do you suppose that you might, with a brain that's only that small, mine too, that you would be able to grasp the infinite mystery that is the Godhead? So we accept it because we read it in the Scriptures. Here's some things that we actually read about it. Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Here's a perfect picture of the Trinity. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God. There's the third person of the Trinity, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven. Who's that? That's that's God the Father, right? A voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, the the second person of the Trinity, uh, Christ, with whom I am well pleased. You see all three members of the Trinity in this uh, one incident, and Jesus later commanded us concerning our practice of baptism that it should be done, this is Matthew 28, 19, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Every person we baptize here, in a couple of weeks we're going to be doing this, every person as they go down into the water, the pastor is going to say, I baptize you now on the, on the basis of your profession of faith in Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You can see throughout the New Testament also benedictions like the one at the end of Second. Uh, Corinthians, at the end of 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We see the Trinity throughout the Scriptures being pictured for us. Now, we might think, and we have to be so careful about this, especially as we talk about God the Father, that somehow because He's Father, because He dwells... um, sitting on this throne in heaven and dwells in in unapproachable light, because of that, we might have the mistaken notion that somehow 
the Father is preeminent when it comes to the Trinity. We don't even really find out about the Spirit till much later, and Jesus comes along, and He's obviously the Son, so he, and so we, we might have this mistaken notion that somehow within the Trinity there's ranking. And we need to reject that. In fact, uh, Thomas uh, Watson said this, if there be one God subsisting in three persons, then let us give equal reverence to all the persons of the Trinity. There's not more or less in the Trinity. The Father is not more God than the Son and the Holy Ghost. There is an order in the Godhead, but no degrees. One person has not a majority or a super eminence above another. Therefore, we must give equal worship to all the persons. And so no temptation to think that the Father is greater than the Son or the Spirit, because He is not. We need to be careful that in our emphasis of Jesus and speaking His name, which is glorious and wonderful and due to Him, that we not underemphasize the Father, that we not underemphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in working out our salvation. All deserve our attention. All deserve our worship. All right, ready for this then? We've established what we believe. Now we're going to move on to why we believe it. Why we believe that God the Father is the Trinity, and I need to say this, this message is not an apologetic in the sense of it's, I'm not trying to argue for the existence of God, so much as I'm pointing to the one authority that we do have that we can trust, which is the Word of God, and seeing why I believe that God the Father is part of the Trinity, so we're looking at the Scriptures to support that, so why I believe that God the Father is the first person of the Trinity first, uh, the Father can be seen in creation. Notice uh, Genesis 1.1, you may know this verse, uh, in the beginning, God, speaking specifically of God the Father, God created the heavens and the earth, though both Christ and the Holy Spirit were involved in the creation, God created the heavens and the earth, God created man, later on in chapter 1, God created man in his own image. The creation testifies to the very existence of God. Look at Romans 1, 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, them being those who are unbelievers, who have rejected God, who are going about life in their own way. What Paul is going to argue here is, even if they don't have the gospel, even if they don't have the Bible, even if they've never heard the name Jesus, they should be able to look at the creation and see the evidence of God. Romans 1.19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, we're going to talk about those in a minute. Namely, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I mean, this whole deal with Instagram and you see pictures and people post these beautiful pictures of mountains and lakes and sunsets and all of this. And people are constantly saying, look how God's blessed us. Look at the creation. Look at what God has done. And that's right. That's Romans 1. That's the creation testifying to the very existence of who our God is. The Father can be seen in creation. There are so many people out there who are trying to disprove this, though, and just want to see the world in a natural way. I saw an article this week in Relevant Magazine. This was online. Um, this is what uh, the headline said. Did CERN scientists just say that the Big Bang Theory isn't possible? The Big Bang Theory, of course, is that everything started with this colossal explosion in the universe and that sent everything out in a way and altered the makeup of the universe in such a way that life was created, that the planets came to be, that orbits were established. The Big Bang was the thing that started it all. Here's the problem the CERN scientists have. By the way, the CERN scientists are in a mountain on the French and Swiss border, and, and they've got these um, a, a particle accelerators and these uh, uh, hadron, the Hadron Super uh, Collider and all of these things, and they're way beyond my knowledge base right now. We're getting into dangerous territory of science with Todd. All right? <laughs> but what they're trying to do the part I do understand is they're trying to make, figure out what the universe is made of and how it started and how it works. And they've been doing this for decades now. They're trying to figure out. And now 
Here's what they've discovered. There's such perfect, there's such perfect balance between matter and antimatter in the universe, 100% balance, that they can't find a way that a Big Bang would have ever happened. You need to have something upset that. But the balance is so perfect between matter and antimatter. So now we have a problem. How exactly did the universe start? Okay, let me jump from something I don't understand uh, totally, science, into the realm of philosophy. And Aristotle, how many people remember philosophy class from school? You remember this? How many people remember going to it but nothing that was said? <laughs> so in philosophy class, we talked about Aristotle. And Aristotle talked about, because he looked at the universe and he said there had to be something outside of the things we see. And he called that the unmoved mover. Now, Thomas Aquinas, who was a Christian philosopher, Thomas Aquinas took that and said a little bit further than Aristotle ever intended. And he said, I know who the unmoved mover is. It's God. God is the unmoved mover. God is the one who took perfect balance between matter and antimatter in the universe and created everything that there is. The unmoved mover moved. He spoke into the darkness. And the universe and the planets and all living things came to be. And we see that in the evidence of creation. We see it. In intelligent design, we know who the intelligence is behind it. We know the designer. It's God the Father. God spoke and the universe was created. The Father can be seen in creation. Secondly, look at this. The Father's not like us. He's not like us. He's transcendent. I need a God who's not like me. Okay, I was expecting a few more amens. <laughs> not specifically about God not being like me, but maybe God not being like, like you. Okay? The Father's not like us. He's transcended. In fact, um, we would say this. He has multiple characteristics that make him God. If you like big thousand-dollar words, these are the incommunicable attributes of God. In other words, these are attributes, things about God that cannot be communicated or transferred to us. They're things that make him unique. These are the things that make him, this is the word transcendent, make him other, different than us. Okay? These are the the incommunicable attributes of God. Let me give you nine of them. Sovereign. He's sovereign. He's in charge of everything. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Omnipotent, all-powerful. Omniscient, all-knowing. Omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Or better, the scriptures say, all of creation is before him. Love that. He's the one and only. He's uh, imminent in the sense that he is present and active in the world. He's unchanging or immutable. He's infinite and he's eternal. And in all of those ways, he is God and we are not. Not one of those attributes could be applied to anyone in this room or anyone on this planet. In fact, God said of himself, Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I'm super glad we have a God who's not like me. Amen? But note also, so he's, the Father's not like us, but also the Father is like us, or rather we can be like Him in quite a number of ways. Because we know this, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God created man, humanity, in His own image. That is to say, we have the imprint of God on our lives. We are the image bearers of God in the world. This is different than every other living being. How many people love their pets here? If you love your pet, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. How many people would say you have an unnatural attachment to your pet? Confess your sin now. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing about your pets. I know you love them, but they are different than you in the sense that when God created them, he just spoke and said, dog, and there was a dog. Okay, but when he created you, he fashioned you out of the ground. And then he did something he didn't do for the rest of creation. He breathed his very life into the creation of the man and the woman. In other words, he put his spirit in us so that we are spirit and soul, something no animal has. The Father is like us. Rather, we are like him. We have the imprint of God, his image in our lives. 
And so there are certain attributes of God. Now we call these the communicable attributes of God, the things that can be transferred, the things that God is like that we should be like because we're his image. Things that I should imitate. Nine communicable attributes of God. This is not an exhaustive list. Goodness, love, truthfulness, wisdom, holiness, justice, kindness, mercy, faithfulness. God is 100% perfectly all of these things. And you should be furiously writing the list down to say, I want to be those things too. I want to be all of that. I want to be 100% that in my own life so I can be like the Father who created me. And that there is any moral sense in the world at all. And there is. There's a moral sense in the world. The world doesn't necessarily know where they got that moral sense. And I'm telling you, it's right here. We got it from our Creator. Even those who don't know Christ, who don't follow Him, who don't believe in God, have some sense of a, of a moral center because of the Creator. But we who believe in Him and love Him and are following Him should be seeking to emulate Him in every way we possibly can. The Father is like us. We can be like Him. Now, I believe all of this, everything that I'm saying... Because I can see that the Father is sovereign over all. This is one of the incommunicable attributes of God that we need to isolate. And really to understand the sovereignty of God, I think the best thing to do is to look at power on power. Let's think about uh, the strongest human power we can think of and compare that to the power of God. The strongest human power we can think of is probably political power, some superpower, some, some emperor or president. In the scriptures, we have an amazing example of this in King Nebuchadnezzar, who had a vast empire, the Babylonian Empire, who was so successful and who conquered peoples all over the known world. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 4, he's so proud of himself. He stood on the roof of his palace and he looked over his kingdom and he began to look at everything he had done and pat himself on the shoulder and the back and just to say, look at everything I've accomplished. And he began to speak in terms of glory and majesty. That's a pretty bad line to trip over. And immediately the Lord disciplined him and brought him low and for a great season for years he grazed in the wilderness and, and his hair grew long and he lost his mind and his nails grew out like claws. He became as a beast. Finally, he realized the mistake he had made in Daniel 4, 34 and 35. This is what Nebuchadnezzar says, at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And His kingdom endures from generation to generation. In other words, I started to think that I had the incommunicable attributes of God in my life. And I didn't. My kingdom isn't forever. I don't have dominion over all other dominions. Only God has that. He says, all the inhabitants of the earth, including himself, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And speaking of God, he says, he does according to his will. God's going to do whatever he pleases. He does according to his will among the host of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. None can say to him, what have you done? Because God is sovereign. Nothing happens in this world that is not fully under the control of God. Now, yes, for sure, because I can hear the objections. God has allowed sin to reign as a result of our choice in this world. The devil has been granted freedom by the Lord to influence us, but his leash is short and his time is coming to an end. In the unseen conflict between good and evil, God and Satan, we, we, think we're, we think we're all that. But in the unseen battle between dark and light, Satan and God, human, humanity is actually in charge of nothing. 
We're in charge of nothing. Nothing short of full surrender to him will do. We must acknowledge that the Father who sits on the throne of heaven and who dwells in inapproachable light is sovereign over all. Well, finally, for this section, the Father provides the way of salvation. John 3.16, a very familiar, will include verse 17 here. Allow me the insert, for God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God the Father did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We can see the father's unique role in providing the way of salvation, of forgiveness, of reconciliation with God, of hope, of a glorious eternity with him forever. The redemption gained through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead was as much an act of the father We often think about Jesus and we don't think so much of the Father's role and the Spirit's role in all of this. But it was as much an act of the Father as it was of the other two two members of the Trinity. For God is one. The Father gave us His only Son. We have no hope without the Father doing this. Father provides the way of salvation. Now, this is why I believe that God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. I hope that you can say I believe all of these things too. But with that doctrine now established, we're not interested in doctrine for doctrine's sake. Doctrine always affects practice. Our lives will be impacted by what we believe. And so, now let's look at this, how I'm living because of it. Let's start with this. I know what I mean when I say Father. I know what I mean when I say Father. You see, I, I want to call him Father. I, I need to call him Father. I see this model in the Scriptures. I see that of all the ways that Jesus could possibly have addressed the first person of the Trinity, the way that he does repeatedly is by calling him Father, his favorite designation. And so we have to do this, but it has to be talked about right now. At this time in our history, a generation ago, we wouldn't even have needed to talk about this. But we live in a different day. And there are different pressures. We need to talk about this first because our society is so sensitive to gender issues. To gender equality. And the maleness of God that's pictured for us in the scripture demands that we address that. And some who are pastors and theologians in churches are abandoning the gender-specific, the male-specific language for God and going to something that the Bible does not model for us. So we have to address it for that reason. And secondly, we have to address it for this reason. Many people grow up in situations where the father figure in their lives only elicits pain and bad feelings, where the experiences were not good ones, and calling God Father brings all of that up again. So a word about this. I need you to hear this. Though God has chosen to reveal, watch me, though God has chosen to reveal himself, are you with me? Okay. You think I'm dangerously close to heresy right now. Though God has chosen to re- reveal himself in terms of male, a male human image, he is not male or female. He's not. Nothing in the scriptures would indicate that. The dominant picture of God in the Bible is unmistakably male, but we also see maternal descriptions of God. Do you want a little list? That was a question. Do you want a little list? Yes, Isaiah 49, 15. Uh, God is depicted as a nursing mother. Or how about Hosea 13, 8? God is depicted as a mother bear. Uh, Don't mess with my cubs, okay? That's what's happening in Hosea 13. How about Matthew 23, 37? Uh, God is uh, pictured as a mother hen gathering uh, her chicks under her wings for protection. 
So we need to be careful about saying that God is male when he's not. Further, God doesn't have a physical body as we do. His likeness is reflected. He's spirit. God is spirit. And his image, the image that he put on us as human beings when he created us, his image is only really seen in both male and female. Only in both human genders do we have a more complete reflection of the image of God. And so if you have trouble with God as Father, and I have no doubt that many in this room might, you have to set aside your human projections and perceptions of what that means and instead reach out to God as Father as the Son did and does. I want you to hear this. I'm, just bear with me. I'm going to read it so you get it. To call God Father is an unparalleled and gracious invitation into an intimate loving relationship with him. Far from the cold, mechanical, unsatisfying, ritualistic, and liturgical religion offered by all others, we are called sons and daughters. We are given a place in the family while being invited to use the warm, personal, loving designation of Father for our great God, and Savior. Now, I know that there's a lot of hurt here for many. Before we leave this point, could I lovingly and gently suggest some things? That the challenges anyone might have with the notion of calling God Father is more our problem than His. Is that fair? The sin tainted world we live in has corrupted all that the Creator called good including the most precious of our relationships, God clearly used the concept of Father because it most closely resembles and reflects the relationship that we should have with the first person of the Trinity. Sin has skewed our perspective, not His. We need to make the change, not Him. I know what I mean when I say Father. And just a short step to this. I've received his love. I've received the love that comes from the Father. Having understood what I know about God now, this is how I'm applying it to my life. I'm receiving his love that starts with receiving the offer that God has made of salvation through his son Jesus Christ. Romans 5 8. God the Father shows his love for us in that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And I hope you've all done this, but I certainly don't want to make any assumptions about anyone in the room. We can be awfully hard on liturgical churches where it's just ritual and people go and out of routine and tradition go through the motions but appear to be unchanged. Well, listen, it's not really much different here. We're not a formalistic church. We're, we don't have a lot of rites and rituals here. But we can no less easily fall into a routine that means we don't actually have Christ. In some respects, we've made it so comfortable for you to come here. We've provided a wonderful facility with comfortable chairs. The music is great. We have great people around you. The coffee is amazing. And we can follow into. It's pretty easy to come here. I just like it. I'm going to start doing the things that everyone else around me is doing. I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to find a place to serve. I'm going to become a member. I'm going to give all the appearance and fall all into all the trappings of what it means to be part of this church family. You can do all of that and not have Christ. Because you've never gotten to the place where you've actually confessed it, where you've actually said, I'm a sinner, I can't do it on my own, I need Christ to save me, and I'm going to follow him. If you've not done that, do it right now. You don't need to wait till the end of the service, you don't need to talk to an elder or a pastor, you don't need to talk to anyone. 
You don't need a special moment. You don't need me to say, raise your hand or walk the aisle or sign a card. Because right now in this moment, you can just simply say, he's talking about me. I need to get saved in this moment. I need the Savior's love. And when you do that, let me tell you, you're assured of it. God's never going to stop loving you. If you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he loves you. And he's going to pour out the maximum amount of, of his love that you will take upon yourself. And it's limitless. And so we need to understand his love and receive it for ourselves. How you doing? You doing okay? Three more to go. You going you gonna to make it? How I'm living because of it, because of this doctrine. Uh, third, I understand his discipline. I understand his discipline. Discipline can be positive or negative. But let me uh, say this. God is not in any way a permissive parent. Now, as I was preparing this section, I felt a rant coming on. And uh, because I'm up at the front and because I can, I will. (laughs) Permissiveness in parenting accomplishes nothing good. Child-centered homes are a disaster and set up children for failure. Cheryl and I were so careful to make sure that our kids knew we were in charge. And sometimes I would say to them, uh, the three of them, I would say to them, um, you guys are a team, the three of you. Mom and I are another team, and we always win. We always win. Isn't that right? I said that to you so many times. And it, listen, Children are not in charge of the home, and if you're lazy or you're tired or you think this is the best way to do it by putting your child at the center, that's a problem. Nor should your home be a parent-centered home. Okay, that's just selfishness, but a Christ-centered home. How about that? That sound right? A Christ-centered home. Children, in fact, I would say this, children want discipline and boundaries, Cheryl, Uh, Cheryl and I both taught school for uh, several years. Cheryl was uh, way better at it than I was, and she she taught grade two, and she had a very disciplined classroom environment. And um, if if you've ever served in a ministry that she's led, then you'll know. It's like there are rules, and this is the way we're doing it, and and, uh, she defined everything really well. She would say all the time, children want this. Children want discipline. They want you to set boundaries around them. They they want you to give them guidance. They want it. Because what that does, and we're going to see this in a passage in a second. Listen, what that does, it actually communicates to the child, though they can't fully articulate this, it communicates to the child they're loved. Mom and dad care enough to kind of put some guardrails up and to tell me where I'm going to hurt myself. Okay, well, listen. um, End of parenting rant, okay? End of that part of it. This is exactly what the Father does for us. He provides us with really the only parenting lesson we really need in Hebrews 12. And I'm just going to cite one verse for the sake of time, but I'm going to tell you, read Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, but look at verse 6. The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. He disciplines. If you're a child of his, he's going to discipline you. He is. And in that discipline, the setting of boundaries and the guidance and the correction and all of that, you should hear that he loves you. And so what does that mean? That means that every trial that you go through, every setback that happens in your life, not one of them is wasted. Every bit of pain you experience, all the suffering, all the difficulties, all the troubles that you have in this life, all of it is the discipline of the Lord to protect us, to grow us, to bring us to maturity. Every single bit of it communicates from God that he loves us because he's helping us to grow up in him. And so I would just say this. Here's some great advice. You don't want to have to be disciplined twice for the same thing. Amen? Lord, I want to get this the first time. Amen? I want to get it the first time. So don't resent his discipline. Don't chafe at his discipline. Don't resist his discipline. Don't argue his discipline. Don't fight his discipline. Understand his discipline and learn from it. That's pretty good advice, I think.
All right, here we go. Another one, I'm submitting to his will. Hard on the heels of that one now, I'm submitting to his will. Now, a big part of submitting to his will happens when I have a vibrant, active prayer life. Now, I don't know, of all the disciplines that we could possibly practice as the followers of Christ, don't you think that prayer is the hardest? Is prayer not the hardest? Just to stay at it, to be faithful at it, to not let our minds wander, to not fall asleep, to do it faithfully, to not make it just about a list. I mean, having a vibrant prayer life is the hardest thing of all, but prayer more than anything else gets me aligned with the will of God. More and more, you see, as you're reading the scripture, you're just seeing it over and over again, that when people are finally getting aligned with God's will, they're usually praying. This is where I'm I'm speaking to him and he's conforming my heart and my mind to his will. And prayer, far, far, far from getting what I want from God in prayer, which is usually what our prayer, praying is, right? God, I have a list. I have a few things I need to bring up with you. If you could deliver, that would be awesome. That's what most of our prayers are like. Here's a list of things. I want these. Far from getting what I want from God in prayer, prayer actually gets me what God wants for me. That's when we really begin to get what prayer is all about. I'm receiving what God wants for me, and I get to the place where I want that too. And this kind of aligning with God prayer, this is the kind of thing we see modeled for us by Jesus. By the way, every time he prayed, except for one instance, every time he prayed, he prayed to the Father. And he taught us to pray. This is what we we hear, Matthew chapter 6, 9 and 10. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. He prayed in the garden prior to his arrest and his crucifixion. He's agonizing in prayer, and he says to the Father, this is in Luke 22, 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of suffering from me. Let's find a different way to do this. And then he gets aligned with the will of the Father through prayer, and he says... Not, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I wonder if that sounds like your prayers. God, I'm asking for this, but but I want your will. Ultimately, I want what you want. Am I submitting to his will? And then this, uh, finally, I'm taking on his character. And we looked at those communicable attributes of God that are to be growing in us as we walk with him. Ephesians 5.1 says, be imitators of God as beloved children. Be imitators of the Father as beloved children. So these communicable attributes, we'll put them on the screen again. Goodness, love, truthfulness, wisdom, holiness, justice, kindness, mercy, faithfulness. Am I living these out? Am I becoming more and more like the Father in all of these things? Am I becoming what God created me to be? It's a lifetime of work on that screen. Well, all of that, what we believe and how that's impacting and changing our lives should be paramount in our minds and our hearts. Now, as we close this out, let me just say this. This week, our how many people knew we had a new governor general? Did you know that? Her name is Julie Payette. And uh, she's been on the job for like a month. And she's already... Um, in hot water, which is normally not what a governor general does. She gave a speech this past week where she, among other things, mocked people of faith, considered us to be non-intellectual. Now, she is a person of science, which many people believe is antithetical to faith. I don't personally believe that. Science does not disprove faith, but is the exploration, science is the exploration about how God's doing it. Okay, that's what science is. Science is the discovery of God's system. But she mocked people of faith. And in Romans chapter 1, this shouldn't surprise us. Romans chapter 1 tells us that we as human beings actually actively suppress the truth. It's hardwired into us, into our sin nature to reject truth and to believe lies. In fact, Psalm 14.1 says the fool says in his or her heart, sometimes the fool says it with his or her mouth, 
there is no God. But in fact, there is, and someday, Her Excellency the Governor General will know that. Someday we'll all know that. And I would just say, wouldn't it be better if we acknowledged the Father now and worshipped Him now, together? Here I stand. Can you say it? Here I stand. God the Father is the first person of the Trinity. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, it is um, a unique privilege for us to hold your word in our hands, to have these truths taught to us in a way that is clear and in many ways simple. We sense the urgency of it in our lives to not only know it, but believe it and live it out. Thank you for revealing yourself to us in this way. And God, I pray This message in a lot of ways is daunting. It's daunting intellectually to put our minds around it. And it's daunting spiritually to live it out. But I pray, God, that we would commit ourselves in a new and fresh way here today to take upon these characteristics that you've put in front of us, the characteristics that you embody and exemplify perfectly, that we would live these things out as best we can by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray for any in the room who have not yet committed their life to Christ. Before they leave this building, this property, they will bend their knee. They will give their heart to you to follow you all the days of their life. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us again today and for gathering us together in this place as the church. We pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ.